Hello, everybody, and welcome. We have just a few seconds before the start of the session. Thank you all for joining. Um, while you're waiting, feel free to send a quick hello in the chat, your name, where you're joining from, and what you are most interested about today's session. You can see some people are still joining. That's great. Um, for today's webinar, we will have presentations in French and in English. So if you prefer to listen in French, you can click on the simultaneous interpretation button at the bottom of the screen. You should have the option to select French or English. I'm switching to French now. Bonjour à tous, bienvenue. Bienvenue à notre webinaire d'aujourd'hui. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. If you prefer to listen in French, you can click on the simultaneous interpretation button at the bottom of the screen. You should have the option to choose between French and English in the menu that opens. Okay, I see some are still joining. So, hello. For those who just joined, welcome. Feel free to send a quick hello in the chat, your name, where you're joining from. My name is Anne Charlotte. I am a project coordinator at the Green Municipal Fund of FCM, and I am joining today from Ottawa, Ontario. Welcome to our webinar on how to adapt Green Municipal projects to stand the test of time. Just a quick hello, Nanaimo, City of St. Albert. Hello, everybody. Okay, I think we can start. So before diving into this exciting fast-paced webinar, I'd like to pause for a, a minute here. On behalf of FCM, I'd like to begin this webinar by acknowledging that we are meeting on lands that have been inhabited by indigenous people for thousands of years. We at FCM recognize the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people as the traditional custodians of the land upon which FCM's offices and myself um, are currently situated, and we deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions of Metis, Inuit, and all First Nations, both in shaping and strengthening this community and our country as a whole. So please, wherever you are, Join me in paying our respects to the original stewards of this land and committing ourselves to thoughts and actions that will lead to meaningful reconciliation wherever we live now. If you're unsure about the traditional territories of indigenous nations where you are located, you can check out the map my colleague will share in the chat. So my name is Anne Charlotte Olivier, project coordinator at GMF, and I am also joined today by three amazing speakers, my colleague Paulina and my colleague Jim Wren. So, welcome to our last webinar of an exciting GMF series, providing useful knowledge about the very beginning of a sustainable project, from the ideation, planning, to the very end, its legacy. In that sense, the first webinar focused on building a strong business case for your municipal project, the second on transitioning from a study or a pilot project to a capital, and the third on maintaining a project success over time. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the FCM's website within a couple of weeks. Recording of webinar one is already available on FCM's website. My colleague Paulina will share the links shortly. And recording of webinar two and three uh, will follow. Just saying, Jill looking at the chat. Yes, that's awesome. Thank you, Paulina. Um, first, a few housekeeping uh, items to get through. Each of our presenters today has prepared a seven minute presentation to share with you. We're going to run through each presentation, one after the other, and use our remaining time for discussion and Q&A. You are welcome to ask questions in the chat, in French or in English, and I will keep an eye out 
for any clarification questions or other key items that we should address before the Q&A. Please keep your microphone off uh, during the presentations. And lastly, a reminder that if you prefer to listen in French or in English, you can select the simultaneous interpretation option at the bottom of your screen and choose the French channel for French or English channel for English. I will now hand it over to my colleague, Jim Ryan, uh, advisor within our programs outreach unit, who will shortly present FCM and GMF funding offers before we dive in this exciting webinar with our speakers. Jim, over to you. Thank you, Anne Charlotte. Welcome everyone. Thank you for connecting with us today and I hope you are all doing well. As many of you know, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities or FCM is a nonprofit organization that acts as the national voice of municipal governments in Canada. We operate a variety of funding and educational programs that help increase sustainability in communities across the country and enhance quality of life for residents. This includes a number of green initiatives, programs on women in government, climate protection, and international development, to name a few. It also includes our largest program, the Green Municipal Fund, which is a $1 billion program funded by the Government of Canada that provides funding and capacity building resources for municipalities to undertake sustainable projects in a variety of sectors. You may be familiar with the Green Municipal Fund core offer. It's our traditional funding offer that has been around in some form or another for the last 20 years. Under our core offer, we provide funding for plans, feasibility studies, pilot projects and capital projects in a wide array of sectors. I encourage you to visit fcm.ca forward slash funding to learn more about these funding opportunities. As part of budget 2019, FCM received a $1 billion investment from the federal government for three new funding initiatives that are all within the energy sector. These include our community efficiency financing program, which focuses on supporting the development of programs they use innovative funding mechanisms like PACE or on-bill financing to allow residents to assess and implement energy retrofits on their homes with the savings in energy costs used to pay back the initial capital investment. Our second spin-off program involved two components, first being a collaboration with Low Carbon Cities Canada, or LC3 for short, that is in the process of setting up small GMF style funds in seven of Canada's larger metro metropolitan centers. For example, you may be familiar with the Atmospheric Fund in Toronto and we will be hearing from Brian Purcell in moments. The second part of this funding is specifically for lowering GHG emissions in municipally or nonprofit owned community buildings. Things like arenas and pools, for example. This funding will also be taking an approach to support long-term planning of an asset with the end goal being near net zero carbon over time instead of solely one-off retrofits. This funding will be launched shortly. Finally, our Sustainable Affordable Housing Initiative, which launched just under a year ago, provides municipal and non-profit affordable housing providers access to funding and resources that can lower energy use and improve conditions within Canada's aging affordable housing stock. Typically, the Green Municipal Fund offers grants for early project stages such as plans, studies, and pilot projects, and a combination of low interest loans and grants for larger capital intensive stages of a project. What do we mean when we talk about an energy financing program? At its core, it's about creating a new financial product to help more homeowners upgrade the energy performance of their home, either through energy efficiency measures, renewable energy installations, or a combination of the two. Some of the common models we see include property assessed clean energy financing, or simply PACE for short, with this model, loan repayment is secured by a lien added to the property tax assessment. Utility on bill financing, which allows homeowners to pay back their financing via their natural gas or electricity bill. 
In some cases, the charges are structured so that the cost savings from the home retrofit can, over time, be used to cover a portion or the entirety of the investment. Direct lending occurs when a municipality works with a credit union or bank to offer a customized financial product with more attractive rates and longer repayment terms than on the market, as well as a simple and convenient homeowner application process. Municipalities and their partners may apply to the Community Efficiency Financing Program at any time throughout the year. The Green Municipal Fund's Community Buildings Retrofit, or CBR for short, initiative supports municipal and not-for-profit organizations that own and operate community buildings in optimizing the energy performance of those buildings and measurably reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. These buildings are cornerstones of strong, vibrant communities and include recreational, for example, indoor arenas, indoor pools, community centers, and cultural facilities such as art centers and libraries. These tend to have some of the highest energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, and operating costs of all municipal buildings. CBR will support community buildings in need of maintenance and repair to realize long-term operating cost savings while achieving significant GHG reductions through the identified energy efficiency retrofits. Thank you, Jim, for this uh, short overview of FCM and GMF funding. If you have questions related to what Jim just presented, uh, feel free to post them in the chat in English or French, and Jim will be pleased to answer them, and it will also be available uh, during the Q&A at the end of the webinar. So now let's dive into our webinar's topic, how to adapt green municipal projects to stand the test of time with our three amazing speakers of today. So we will hear first uh, from Alberta with Michael Hay and its fleet of hybrid buses, and then from Brian Purcell in Ontario on Toronto's Community Housing Energy Retrofits Project. And finally, we will listen to Juan Welle sharing stories about the pilot project Sauvé, who became more than just a pilot now. So Michael Hay is our first speaker. Uh, Michael has been the manager of environment and sustainability for the town of Banff since 2019. He is passionate about a variety of urban sustainability issues, including sustainable transportation and waste reduction, all of which are critical issues for the town of Banff and Banff National Park overall. Michael has led many of Banff's recent sustainability projects, including Rome Transit's new burst garage, a new biomass heating facility, and several solar energy projects. He works closely with Banff's administration and council to continue Banff's quest to be a model environmental community. Today, Michael will share the exciting ongoing story of the BAMS hybrid bus project. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Anne Charlotte. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, uh, depending on where you are in the country. Um, I'm Michael Hay, Manager of Environment for the Town of Banff, and today I'll be talking about our hybrid bus project, and, and I think more than anything else, its legacy as well, which is a very rich legacy. I work quite closely with the Bow Valley Regional Transit Service Commission or Rome Transit. Um, so hopefully I can give you some interesting information. The town of Banff, since its founding in 1885, has really been about people. It's a place for people to come and see. Uh, and though the park does protect a vast wilderness, it is really the town of Banff that forms the central experience for the 4 million visitors to come here every year. And that number is increasing. Um, only in the last seven years, we've seen a 30% increase in visitation. The pandemic has given us some time to catch our breath, but all of these people do present challenges for the town and for the park overall. And the big challenge here is just the number of people. So Banff is a very, very busy place, especially during the summer and on the weekends. We have really crowded sidewalks, busy trails, and overflowing campsites. 
and there are certainly a lot of people in the park, but, but that's a good thing. These people bring business and economic strength to the park. The, what they do bring though, that we don't want is a lot of cars. So these are some webcam images from around the town site and the park. Cars bring wildlife collisions, more pollution, more congestion, which ruins the visitor experience. And uh, it makes it harder for locals to get around. And building all these parking lots creates a lot of environmental damage as well. So back in 1991, uh, when we were already starting to see these problems, the town started up a pilot bus project with some, some old creaky diesel buses. Um, they were noisy, they were a bit dirty, there was no real sense of occasion, and uh, they had some accessibility issues as well. Also, they, they're not very clean. So, you know, this is just a photo of an oil slick on one of our bus stops. This isn't really what we want. This isn't really the message we want to send to visitors and residents. This isn't okay in a national park. And obviously it's polluting to, to stormwater as well. The Bow River runs right through town. Um, these buses also weren't really healthy. We want visitors to be breathing fresh mountain air, not the soot from a, an old diesel bus. Um, it's all about the, the experience in Banff. We want people to, to feel like they're somewhere special here. And uh, yeah, th this is not really what we want them to see. So in 2007, council decided to replace those old diesel buses with some new, much cleaner diesel buses. Technology had advanced quite a bit, but uh, eventually decided also to go a step further and go to these new biodiesel and electric hybrid buses. And these were 60% more expensive than standard diesel buses, but FCM helped us out with some funding. Uh, and we felt that it was worth it because these buses have a variety of really interesting features in addition to their hybrid drive. Um, the diesel engine itself has much lower emissions. The buses are wheelchair accessible. And of course we have bike racks um, and uh, a beautiful wildlife wrap around every single one of these buses. Every bus has a unique wildlife wrap. So the one you're seeing here is, is grizzly bears. Uh, but pick an animal in the park and there's probably a bus that has that on it. These are also Canadian made buses, so it's a good um, national uh, success story. At the same time, we took ownership of the transit operation, which we were previously outsourcing, and we rebranded it as Rome Transit, which is, which is still the branding today. The idea here is that uh, when you're in Banff, you want to roam around kind of like the wildlife do. Uh, maybe a bit of a tongue-in-cheek when in Rome joke there as well. And the third big thing we did back in 2008, 2009 was we built a new transit facility to support these buses. This is a LEED certified facility. It's very energy efficient, lots of water conservation measures and plenty of room to grow. Um, lots of beautiful pictures in this story as well. Uh, what the, what actually happened here though, is we saw a great increase in ridership in the years following this. Part of this is due to the rebranding and the, the much more pleasant buses, but we also added a bunch of additional routes. So when you add new routes, those routes actually help the existing routes by creating, uh, by drawing in more people from a larger area. And to support all of this, we've had to grow the fleet. And this is the really impressive slide here from four buses in 2008 we've increased to 30 buses by the end of this year, which is an amazing amount of growth for, for such a small community in the mountains. So we have all kinds of buses now. We have night buses, we have big highway coaches going to other communities like Lake Louise and Canmore. We have night buses, long buses, short buses, and really, really short buses. And they're all very, very pretty buses. And again, they all have this, this lovely wildlife wrap. So it's a, a variety experience, but also a very interesting experience. Right now, we're really, really excited about three new electric buses, our first zero emissions buses that are that are coming to town. And I'm, I'm really happy to, to announce that they're actually arriving tonight. So this is an auspicious day uh, to be giving this presentation. These uh, buses were supposed to arrive yesterday, but they were held up from the, with a snowstorm on the prairies and they will arrive tonight. And those buses will be housed in our brand new Rome Transit Garage. And only 12 years after the first Transit Garage, we now have a second, much larger facility um, to house 32 buses with, again, more room to expand. This isn't just a plain old garage. It's actually a symbol um, and, and a Kickstarter for a lot of great initiatives. We have our first district heating system 
in the town site is heating this building. That district heating system is powered with wood chips that we derive from waste. And there's a very large solar array on the roof. And that solar array will charge those electric buses. And you know, just to take this to the next level, Rome Transit is expanding so rapidly that it is actually starting to fill in the gap for Greyhound, who left Western Canada a few years ago. And now Rome Transit is operating an intercity service going all the way from Calgary. Um, so a lot of exciting growth over the last few years. If I had to give three takeaways, it would be number one, you have to invest in people when you're doing a project like this. Don't skip on payroll. Innovation comes from people. Um, transit isn't just about moving people. You have to explore those synergies with other goals like waste reduction. And the last one is just be bold and, and dream big. So that's all. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. And uh, great to hear about uh, new buses. Sorry about the snowstorm. That's a classic Canadian move, I would say, weather move. Okay, so I see we already have a couple of questions. Um, so please keep um, asking questions so for, for Michael uh, in the chat box and we will monitor them and answer them uh, during the Q&A sessions. So our next speaker uh, is Brian Purcell. Uh, Brian is the Vice President of Policy and Programs at the Atmospherics Fund uh, or TAF, an award-winning public agency dedicated to addressing climate change in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area and a founding member of the Low Carbon Cities Canada Partnership that uh, my colleague Jim mentioned earlier. Brian's work focuses on accelerating decarbonization through development of innovative policies, programs, and business solutions. Brian has been instrumental in designing and implementing a range of climate solutions, including TAF's non-debt energy savings performance agreement, which has been used to finance major energy retrofits in, other, in over 20 buildings, housing, over 2,500 households. And today, um, Brian will present Toronto's innovative community housing energy retrofits project. And over to you. Thank you. And good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Purcell. I'm the Vice President of Policy and Programs at the Atmospheric Fund. And we are a public agency that invests in climate solutions across the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. I'm here to tell you about a project that started out as an energy efficiency retrofit, but became something much more than that. The project I'm presenting was undertaken in partnership with Toronto Community Housing. They are the largest housing provider in Canada, providing homes for nearly 60,000 low-income families. As a result of chronic underinvestment in community housing, they have a capital repair backlog of over a billion dollars. Through this project, we completed major energy retrofits in seven buildings that are home to about 1,300 families, a mix of seniors and young families. We aim to reduce energy use and carbon emissions by 30% while developing a model for delivering future energy retrofits in their portfolio and beyond. And we largely succeeded in these objectives. The project creates over $450,000 in annual utility cost savings and 920 tons in carbon reductions. Savings are guaranteed for 10 years with quarterly monitoring reports to ensure problems are quickly identified and corrected. But energy and carbon reductions are only half of the story. The other half of the story is about providing better homes and greater opportunities for the people living in these communities. People living below the poverty line, mostly from racialized communities, struggling to build a better future or simply to live out their twilight years with dignity. We asked ourselves early on, can an energy retrofit help people in some small way with those struggles? We came up with two ways. First, it can make their homes healthier and more comfortable. Quality housing is the foundation for health and well being. Poor quality housing is linked to negative health outcomes as well as reduced employment and educational opportunities. Before putting shovel to ground, we surveyed residents to understand their perceptions of health and comfort conditions in their homes. We also instrumented the buildings to monitor air quality and thermal comfort, collecting over 30 million data points. What we found was eye-opening. Both the sensor data and 
and surveys showed that thermal comfort and air quality were serious problems. It became clear that the same outdated heating and ventilation systems responsible for high energy use were also negatively impacting health and comfort. Sustained exposure to temperatures over 26 degrees Celsius is strongly correlated with increased mortality and morbidity. Yet we found that these homes spent the majority of the hours in the year above that threshold, even during the winter. Oversized heating systems combined with no thermostats resulted in chronic exposure to unhealthy temperatures. Fresh air supply was 50% below modern code standards and ductwork was so choked with dust that the term fresh was wholly inappropriate. Complaints of odors and secondhand smoke were frequent. To quote one resident, the smell of smoke and marijuana from the neighbors is making my children sick. She desperately wanted to move out of the building, but she had nowhere else to go. All of this provided critical input to the design process, helping us better prioritize retrofit measures. We replaced aging ventilation systems, increasing fresh air supply by over 50%, and we cleaned all ductwork. And this before and after picture shows you just how badly that was needed. We also replaced outdated heating systems with much smaller and more efficient systems. And we installed smart thermostats to give something residents uh, clearly asked us for and something most of us take for granted, control over their own heating. We repeated our surveys and measurements post retrofit to assess improvements in health and comfort. Exposure to extreme heat was reduced by 34%. In the four buildings where we made the deepest improvements, residents reported a 38% reduction in symptoms associated with poor air quality and a 58% reduction in absenteeism from work or school. The second way an energy retrofit can help people struggling with poverty is through employment opportunities. We wondered, can our project create employment opportunities for community housing res retro residents, enabling them to work directly on improving their own communities? The answer was, of course it can. We found a local social enterprise called Building Up dedicated to training and employing people facing barriers to employment in the construction industry. They provided trained workers with at least 50% being Toronto community housing residents and all of them from marginalized or underrepresented groups. They worked right alongside our conventional contractors with outstanding results. 90% of these individuals have since gone on to apprenticeships or careers in the trades, often with other companies that worked on the project. Building Up now does a million dollars a year in business with Toronto Community Housing and is working with other housing operators in the region. We're now working to scale up our partnership with Toronto Community Housing and expanding it to other housing providers across the region. Last year, we completed our eighth building with them with a ninth approved and a 10th under development. And we have a four building project with another municipal housing provider in preliminary design. With each new retrofit, we're targeting deeper carbon reductions, greater health and comfort improvements, and more employment opportunities for community housing residents. By the end of this year, we aim to have 3,000 homes in design or construction for deep retrofits. Buildings are the largest source of carbon emissions in our region, most of it from housing. Investments in housing have the potential to dramatically reduce emissions while improving health and comfort and creating green jobs. Nowhere is this more true or more necessary than in low-income community housing. Across our region, there are over 100,000 community housing units. We aim to see them all retrofitted by 2030. Doing so would require at least six billion in investment, but would dramatically reduce carbon emissions while generating over 130,000 job years of employment. But more importantly, it would provide better homes, new opportunities, and a foundation for success for the families who live in these communities. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And um, again, if uh, you have questions for Brian, uh, feel free to uh, post them in the chat. Um, also just wanted to point out that this type of uh, initiative um, are an example of what could be financed by 
the SA funding stream that uh, Jim mentioned. Um, okay, so for our last speaker of today, um, Joanne will present in French. So if you prefer to listen in English, you can click on the simultaneous interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and select the English uh, channel. I will speak French now. Donc, uh, Joanne, est notre dernière Joanne is our last uh, speaker for today. Joanne has nearly 15 years of experience with the uh, YHC environment as a vice president of YHC Mobility. She works closely with Quebec and Canadian municipalities on innovative projects for the reduction of greenhouse gases and for the electrification of transportation, just such as the uh, Sauvé concept, uh, which she will share with us in a few moments. Joanne is actively involved in several committees of organizations associated with the environment and energy sectors, such as the uh, Environment uh, Network and the uh, Air and Climate Change Conference. So here you are. Here's to you, Joanne. Hello to everyone. First of all, thank you for uh, to FCM for giving me the opportunity to present the project. I'm called Joanne Willett, Vice President uh, uh, YHC Mobility at YHC Environment. So there is a great story that started with municipalities that wanted to do something concrete to fight against climate change and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And what is SOVE? First of all, it's to meet the transportation needs of uh, municipalities. The objectives of the pilot project were to integrate electrical vehicles into municipal fleets. Each of the municipalities has purchased one or two of these vehicles, so 10 in total. And this uh, survey project has resulted in the installation of nine level two kiosks and one level three. It allows to uh, develop car sharing with employees uh, and the community. And when these vehicles are not used, they are at the uh, uh, disponibility of the communities. You can uh, reserve on the computer, on a tablet or phone application. We wanted to optimize the municipal fleet management. Often they are often underutilized or misused to use the right vehicle for the right purpose. It allows to optimize the use of the new municipal electric vehicle to uh, have them run avoids the use of a fuel vehicle. So V means uh, developing uh, the green electric uh, road concept, installation of electric uh, service station with a charging station. We created an electric uh, charging network and we reinvented the travel, the, the journeys of uh, tomorrow's electric travel. Several benefits are associated with this uh, pilot project. First of all, economic uh, profitability for the municipalities. The, these Vs belong to them. Simple uh, tools that facilitate car sharing, the platform to uh, book them, the modules that are in the vehicle. We want to offer a service to citizens for transportation on the whole of the territory to go to the grocery store, school sports, uh, go to the hospital and so on. Utilizing the potential of electrical vehicles to meet community transportation needs reduction of uh, dependence on uh, petroleum products, reduction of the environmental impact by reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector in Quebec and Canada, development of a public transportation service for the community, local and community revitalizations. There are challenges, of course, changing the mindset of uh, municipal employees. Several uh, employees have their own vehicle, uh, which is used in most uh, cases uh, 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 when it shouldn't be. Employees uh, receive a financial compensation for using their own uh, vehicle. Uh, usually, uh, this doesn't help uh, with using uh, an electrical vehicle. Some people think that making a reservation is too time consuming. Either they take the keys 
or they take a fuel vehicle. And the last one, the municipality needs to appoint the right people to manage the project and beyond. You need to have someone in charge of the fleet management for the project to be successful. Someone who uh, believes in the project, the project funding of uh, $350,000 from FCM and this uh, pilot uh, project ended in, in 2018 and three municipalities decided to pursue car sharing. What are the successes of SOVI? The project brought together six municipalities that shared information throughout the process with webinars, blogs, meetings. Overall, the integration of electric vehicles has been very successful in the participating municipalities. Their first objective was indeed to uh, transfer as far as, far as possible the use of a conventional vehicle. We had extensive uh, media coverage, nearly 150 newspaper articles, radio interviews, and so on. A project that is making process. This project has generated a tremendous amount of interest for several municipalities in Quebec and New Brunswick. So we uh, went for a call for a proposal for um, other municipalities. And so we uh, created the SOVI SCC with is for the electric uh, charging um, station. And then we had another project in New Brunswick with five municipalities. This is still going on right now. The city uh, project for transportation and electrified transportation. This was done with seven uh, municipality. They have one electric uh, uh, car to share with the community like this. The, the citizen can go to the eco center. They can go buy furniture. They can uh, uh, take part in, a, in a moving activities. So these uh, projects are uh, still going on right now. There's another project which is called the uh, Régime de Cité in Gaspésie, Ile de la Madeleine. It's an intelligent public transportation and electrified transportation. This is still going on as we are talking. There are six municipalities from uh, Gaspésia and Madeleine Island. This is a project that is done with the uh, Transportation Commission in Gaspésia and uh, Ile de la Madeleine, and they become the regional operator. So we they provide a service and they integrate the SOVE cars to provide an additional uh, service. And there are three other projects that are also going on. One in Santa Anaclet de Lessard, next to Rimouski. There was one in Val des Monts in, in the Outaouais and Malartic and other municipalities uh, that use uh, the SOVE uh, or SAVE uh, tool. And this is uh, funded by the FCM. The ever evolving tools, we have uh, a new vehicle fleet management platform, a phone application with new uh, features. And it's a module that adapts to all types of vehicles. So strength and uh, projects uh, success is the uh, municipal fleet management solution through car sharing, excellent uh, communication, blog webinar, and so on, and a strong uh, media uh, interest. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Joanne. And all right, um, so thank you, Joanne, Brian, and Michael. Uh, I invite you to turn your camera on because um, this is a Q&A discussion period. So I'm just checking with my colleague how we are, with which question we're going to start. And I think a good one to go back to, uh, Michael, so I know you started to answer a little bit in the chat, but one question for you uh, was um, from Lloyd Talbot, uh, did free park passes increase visitation? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, 2017 was one of the busiest years the park has seen. Um, and that actually continued into 2018 and, and subsequent years. So, um, yeah, it, def it definitely did. The uh, there was another question there. If, if I can just jump on to the next question there, uh, and Charlotte, uh, there was a question about uh, where our buses are manufactured. So uh, our buses are manufactured by Proterra in South Carolina, and 
it's interesting because what we actually did is the city of Edmonton has made a very large purchase of buses from Proterra. And what we did is we only needed three buses. So we worked with them to just slightly expand their order to get the get three additional buses. So we were able to take advantage of the economies of scale of a much larger municipality's uh, purchase, um, which was uh, why, we, why we went with Proterra because there was somebody nearby that was already buying buses from them. Thank you, Michael. Um, I was also wondering, so that it's going to be a question for you all. Um, it's uh, what advice would you give to maintain or enhance the success of a sustainable project once funding ends, because you all mentioned funding at one point. Um, and also um, once funding ends and how do you maintain monitoring and evaluation? I know that was also something mentioned by Brian. Um, so Brian, if you could start on this one. Sure. Well, uh, ongoing monitoring and verification is really essential for certainly many projects and building energy retrofits in particular. If, if uh, you just carry out the renovation and the upgrades and, um, and leave it alone, then savings tend to degrade over time due to you know, problems with maintenance or operational settings and uh, as well as like building operator and, and occupant behaviors. So it's really important to monitor and, and, um, and optimize over time. And we kind of ensured that by building it right into the contracts uh, from the very beginning. So when we contracted with um, the partners, uh, commercial partners, and Ecosystem Energy Services was our prime contractor there, um, we, we built into the contract 10 years of measurement and verification, all uh, arranged in, and contracted for in advance. So um, that really helps a lot to make sure that there's no sort of temptation or discussion about should we keep it going? When do we end it? It's just all was determined up front to do it for 10 years. And, uh, and that is backstopped by a savings guarantee in the case of this project, which um, helps to ensure that everyone's got a stake in maintaining performance and solving problems. Thank you. And just jumping on this quick question. Um, so not sure if you partner with any uh, energy savings company uh, the primary contractor for delivering the retrofits was Ecosystem Energy Services, which uh, they don't self-identify as an ESCO per se, but they're sort of in a similar space of delivering energy retrofit projects and uh, providing, when requested, uh, performance guarantees. Thank you. Um, Joan, um, quels seraient les conseils pour maintenir... What would be your advice to maintain the uh, success of your project, including uh, uh, evaluation uh, and monitoring. There are three uh, municipalities out of six who decided to go on with their project. So these three municipalities who did not go on with their project, it was for political uh, reasons. These were elected people that were uh, working on this and they were not re-elected and no one else uh, was there to support the project. So unfortunately, they didn't go on. But the three other ones did uh, continue. And my advice is to find the right people and to try ha to have someone at each level, uh, municipal staff, um, someone at uh, public works that will take care of the fleet. And, and now with about 30 uh, municipalities that we are working with, they have no trouble because we make sure that the different levels are all represented. Thank you. And Michael, does this resonate what Joanne just said with what happened also with the hybrid buses and your fleet? Sure. So, sorry, Aunt Charlotte. I'm assuming you're just passing me passing the question to me. I was on the interpretation channel there. Um, yes, I was. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and monitoring is, is really important. In our case, I think the most interesting thing is that um, through monitoring our fuel consumption, which we monitor very carefully on a bus by bus basis, uh, we discovered that that the hybrid buses, although they were much much better than our old buses. They, they didn't end up being a lot better than a normal diesel bus in terms of fuel consumption. And that was largely because a lot of our routes are um, highway routes, routes that 
have long periods with no stops, whereas the hybrid buses, they perform really, really well on start-stop routes. So that's that's influenced our decisions going forward. We have bought some diesel buses since then, but it also really drove us hard towards electric. We were, we've been waiting for a long time to go full electric because we felt that was the eventual solution that we needed. And actually right now we're, we're talking about hydrogen buses as well. Um, so there's, there's a lot, lot that goes on when you do that monitoring work. It isn't always um, verifying that everything is wonderful. Sometimes you find out that things aren't working out quite as well and you need to adjust your strategy. So that's been our approach. Thank you, wonderful. And um, I see, so again, a question for all, all of you uh, from Claire. Um, were there any consideration of climate change uh, adaptation resilience in your projects? Um, I'll start with uh, Joanne on this one. Uh, we effectively. Yes. We always uh, consider this in the analysis of our project, but the base is a, an economic uh, analysis so that it it be viable for the municipalities. So uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gases is very important and also the life cycle of, of our uh, uh, batteries for electrical vehicle compared to uh, uh, fuel. So we uh, don't deal with adaptation uh, directly, but yes, it's inserted in this kind of reflection. Thank you. Jim here to uh, maybe jump in uh, because you all mentioned some FCM uh, funding and uh, we have the triple bottom lines uh, effects that are measured and are part of uh, funding. So Jim, if you can talk about this. Sure. Um, so, you know, while we're funding plans, studies, uh, pilots, and obviously capital projects, every aspect along your project management uh, pathway, you really have to concentrate on the triple bottom line. So obviously that includes environmental, economic, and social benefits. And we have subject matter experts here at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to help you understand what the benefits could be for your project. And of course, we're always looking for the most innovative projects, such as the three um, projects here that were presented today. Thank you, Jim. And uh, Brian, so what was, uh, were there any consideration of climate change adaptation or resilience uh, in your project? Uh, yes, in, in two ways. Uh, first, uh, we want to make sure that heating system was future-proof, uh, both that uh, we expect with climate warming, the heating heating demand and the, will go down as the weather gets continues to get warmer. And second, um, we had in mind to eventually do more major envelope improvements to these buildings, which would further reduce heating demand. So we charged the design team with designing for that and putting in place a modular and highly controllable heating system that would operate really efficiently under part loads so we could maintain comfort and performance uh, in the years ahead. Uh, the other way that we considered adaptation and resilience was really um, looking ahead, knowing that uh, summers are gonna continue to get warmer with more heat waves in our region. And uh, that can create dangerous conditions for, for public health in, in buildings. So while we didn't have the budget to bring full air conditioning to these buildings uh, and several of them, we were able to integrate it into ventilation so that we could cool the air coming into the central corridors and, and through that, uh, help uh, moderate temperatures in the summertime in the suites and actually provide a, a kind of safe space if people were feeling too hot in their suites, they could step out into the corridor or common areas of the building and access that cooler air th that was more prominent in the hallways. Um, so it was a limited intervention. We'd like to do more there, but uh, it's an example of how we were thinking about that. A good start though. Um, and Michael, what about you? Um, on, on the first four bus project, not really. Uh, it was mostly a bus upgrade project. But since then, climate adaptation has become very important to the Banff community. We've had major forest fires within striking, dis striking distance of the town. We've had floods in striking distance of the town. And 
all of our infrastructure is increasingly being designed to be self-contained and more resilient. Um, so, you know, the new transit garage roof is designed to be fire uh, resistant more so than, than the old building. We fire smart all of the areas around all of our infrastructure to reduce the likelihood of forest fires um, getting into the town site. And um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a number of things that we do to try and become more resilient. Um, but in terms of those initial four buses, not really, no. Thank you, Michael. Um, so one question again for all of you. Um, so it's more during the implementation phase of your project uh, or pilot project for a survey, what was one factor or main challenge that threatened your program other than access to capital? And uh, what did you do to overcome it? And with this question also, what advice would you share with other communities that are just starting this process? Um, and uh, Joanne, if you wouldn't mind starting answering on this one. Uh, oui, bien sûr. Yes, of course. A, may, a big challenge that we had was with uh, municipal employees. What I explained very quickly earlier on, they were very reticent. They did not want to use uh, another uh, vehicle uh, uh, for several municipalities. They were uh, small, medium or uh, large, whatever. Uh, the pickup of the little car was a very important uh, in order to do their tasks uh, within the municipality. But what we said is that if you, you take your pickup truck or your uh, car is, is uh, sometimes better than, uh, like for instance, if they want to go get a few uh, things, you don't need to take a big truck uh, to go there, but you need to get get your pickup truck to go get a, a deer on the highway. So you have to use the good vehicle for the right uh, um, thing that you need to do. So people, it was especially for public works in, in municipalities, people didn't want to change, but we provided them a lot of training, information, and everything went well afterwards. But uh, this, this did not threaten uh, our project. We had no trouble uh, at that level. And I'm taking advantage of that. You just launched an application to uh, make uh, car sharing uh, easier. So did it help uh, with uh, this uh, behavior since uh, 2015 up until uh, 2019? We had the uh, pilot project in Sauvé. I don't want to talk only about men, but people in, in public works, they were in too much of a hurry. They didn't want to make a reservation on their computers. So that's why we uh, developed uh, a new app and they can click while walking, unlock the car and the car will talk to him and say, yes, you can take me or no, you cannot take me, but uh, only until, uh, such and such a uh, time. This application is not for the community, not, not for external uh, users. It's for the municipality employees so that it's easier for them to use these cars. Thank you very much. Yes, I think, I think the biggest challenge is it's kind of a chicken and the egg situation with transit. I'm not sure if that translates well into French, but uh, the, the problem is that with a lot of transit projects I've seen in a lot of municipalities is that council wants to see the ridership numbers go up to justify investments in transit. Uh, but if you don't make the investment in transit, then the ridership numbers won't go up. So there's a there's an issue where people want the proof before they get the pudding. And um, yeah, I mean, this, this is a, obviously a big challenge for a lot of projects. Um, there was something else I was gonna say, I forget what it was, but uh, you know, we're very fortunate in Banff, we have quite an environmentally progressive administration, council and community. 
um, although there were some, there was some resistance to the project because we didn't know whether it would actually increase ridership. I think there was enough faith and, and, and boldness um, and recognition of the importance of the environmental benefits that come with transit. That council decided to, to go ahead with it. And, and in the graphs that, that I showed in my slides there, you can see that it really did pay off in the end. So yeah, that was our big challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and your advice, as you mentioned in your slide was uh, be bold. <laughs> Um, what about you, Brian? I would say that uh, the biggest challenge we faced uh, for our project was around conventional approaches and attitudes to uh, procurement and contracting for this type of project. As I mentioned, it was a set seven building project and normally in the conventional approach um, that was taken uh, both in our housing corporation and our city, that would have been um, a minimum of 14 different procurement processes and contracts to bring on the people to design and construct those uh, improvements and possibly many more as often these things get broken up into many different contracts and different service providers for different elements. And uh, we really wanted to show the, the capacity for some economies of a scale, some, some aggregation and streamlining to sort of minimize that uh, the time and cost associated with procurement and contracting. Uh, so that took a, a lot of uh, work and a lot of sort of dialogue and convincing to get people on board with replacing all that with a single, uh, first with an integrated project delivery contracting process and with a, a single RFP to bring on board everyone we needed to deliver the project. Um, so just replacing those, yeah, 14 to 21 different processes we would have had uh, with a single procurement and contracting process and with a kind of ongoing contractual relationship that got um, everyone kind of have shared accountability and a shared team to deliver the project. Um, that was a real challenge to get everyone on board with that. But I think in the end, um, you know, it worked well and people were happy with it. Wonderful, thank you. So I am aware of the time. Um, I just so quickly, we had a couple questions on CBR and Ceph. Um, I know Jim, you started to answer. Maybe if you can just in one short minute before we wrap up. Definitely, and I'll just recap. So um, I believe smaller communities have an amazing opportunity to decrease their GHG emissions um, and decrease their um, carbon footprint, of course, through CBR and CEF. Uh, CBR, perhaps smaller communities would concentrate on their local arena if they have one, or their community center, of course. Um, and for CEF, for smaller communities, and, and I didn't mention this in the chat, um, perhaps a regional approach could help uh, and bring together economies of scale uh, for the smaller communities and then perhaps approach your local credit union to understand um, what type of financing package they may be able to offer for perhaps on bill financing or if you're in a province where PACE has enabled or where um, enabling legislation for PACE is available, you could do that as well. So I'll just leave that. Thank you, Jim. And thank you really to Joanne, Michael, and Brian. Um, that was definitely great to hear your answers. And I can see some thank you already in the chat. Um, unfortunately, uh, the hour is already done, so I have to wrap up. Um, so again, if you have any questions, maybe some last minutes one, uh, feel free to post them in the chats. And I'm sure Joanne, Michael, and Brian will be Happy also, you can be in touch with them. Um, so recording will be available uh, in a couple of uh, days, probably after Easter. Uh, so you can see again this uh, amazing presentations and um, please fill out our survey about this webinar and uh, the previous webinars. And if you need any more information, uh, follow the link here that my colleague is also uh, popping in the chat. Uh, CBR launching tomorrow, that was the big news. And so don't forget uh, webinar one. Um, Joanne, Michael, Brian, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was three amazing projects funded by GMF. That was exciting to hear you today. Lots of great answers. And uh, I'm sure some uh, were inspired by your stories. Thank you to FCM for the funding and the invitation. Thank you. 
Thank you. And have a great day, everybody.